Hi, my name is Sarah Kate Ellis, and I'm the president of CEO of GLAD, and I'm here today with the president and CEO of Planned Parenthood, Alexis McGill Johnson. We are thrilled to be here today to talk about this upcoming election, um, coalition building, what's going on in the culture today, and how that is all going to or not going to translate into policy. Um, and protections for marginalized communities. Uh, specifically, I think we're talking today about the LGBTQ community and um, women um, and bodily autonomy. And I'd love to hear from you, Alexis, maybe you can kick us off on what's at stake at this election? I mean, I know that's a huge question, <laughs> but talk to us a little bit from your perspective, what's going on and where are we headed in the next couple of weeks? I mean, can we just say freedom is at stake? Freedom for our ability to uh, control our own bodies, to live and, you know, our our free authentic selves, um, our ability to freely participate in a democracy. And I know just in the last, what, four months plus since the, the decision and Dobbs came down, you know, I've been seeing the impact of uh, folks, uh, women, uh, trans men, non-binary folks who are making incredibly arduous journeys, abortion journeys, literally just to seek access to, to healthcare that they should be able to get in their own state. And some of those same states are also the ones that are coming for the trans community. They're coming for, you know, our voting rights. So I, I feel like it's all intersectional. It's all together. And that is all on the line right now. I've had so many people say to me, how do we all come together? Because we're so much stronger together. And anyone who is anti-trans is usually anti-bodily autonomy, is anti-LGBTQ. You know, it's all so interrelated. And it's all about keeping us marginalized, our voices marginalized, and ours, and I always say our bodies under the control of government. Would you agree with that statement? I mean, I Absolutely. No, it's all about power and control. And I think they are, you know, in some ways, I think they are anti, and then I think they also don't care, right? So like they they are anti, and then they they really don't care about us in, in such a powerful way, because they are trying to consolidate power. They're trying to do everything they can to you know, um, to, to just continue to, to, to basically control and set up all the rules of the game so that they can kind of run the table forever. And, and I think that, you know, they use issues like abortion, they use issues like, you know, um, uh, attacks against the trans community and LGBTQ community. They use issues like, you know, made up issues like critical race theory as ways to distract us from essentially what they are trying to do, which is consolidate and control power. I think that's a great way to put it. So just for those who might not understand what's happened for the LGBTQ community over this past year, that just in this year alone, there have been over 300 anti-LGBTQ bills proposed at the state level. There have been famous ones, right? Like the anti, don't say gay bill. It's right. been a pretty famous one from Florida because that created a dust up between Disney and the governor DeSantis there. There's been a famous one in Texas, but those have now been replicated yeah. throughout the entire country. So much so that last week at the federal level, the don't say gay bill was introduced at the house. You know, I've, I've been talking a lot about Roe v. Wade and the Dobbs decision and how that is step one. That's not the end game. No, <laughs> That's just not at the all. start. Right. Um, when you think, and for the LGBTQ community specifically as well, you know, we always talk about marriage equality, right? Like that decision that was made at the Supreme Court, that's held at the Supreme Court, that the Supreme Court signaled in their Dobbs decision that they that they are want to revisit, and it's been coming up at the state level. But more so is the 2003 Lawrence versus Texas decision mm -hmm. that is based on right to privacy, and that is about intimate gay relationships. That's that what that did was decriminalize being gay. Right. And 
And, and Clarence Thomas specifically said in the Dobbs decision that he thinks we should revisit that decision. Um, and Paxton said he would take it up, right? Yes. So the attorney general in Texas. I keep saying to folks, it, it matters that we safeguard marriage, but if we're criminalized for being together, then it voids our marriages. Like I need to connect the dots for folks right. because everybody's living their life, trying to work their job and raise their families. And they care deeply about these challenges that you and I wake up on a daily basis to fight for. And that's our job to do. But I think we need more outrage. Yeah, absolutely, Sarah Kate. And you're so right to frame this all about our, our freedom to live our lives, right? Our freedom to not have government intervene in our identity, in how we express ourselves, in our bodily autonomy, like all of those things I think have resonated I, very clearly we have seen with uh, with voters post-Dobbs. And I think we'll see very clearly on Tuesday, the idea that, you know, that we, uh, the majority of Americans believe that we should be able to lead free lives um, and maintain our privacy. So what we need to do, right, is we need to hold the House. It is a very tight election uh, in the House, but we know that uh, so many of these issues in this moment right now, I think abortion in particular has, has made this midterm election incredibly competitive. And so we have, a, we have an opportunity here to hold the House. We need to get to 52 in the Senate. And with that combination of Congress and the current administration, we know that we have a president who, and, a, and we will have a Congress willing to reform the filibuster and take two critical votes immediately, first to codify Roe, second to restore our democracy with the John Lewis um, voting rights bill, and and then build, I, as we know, we need to build towards, uh, towards that equality amendment, right, to make sure that we get ourselves back into the Constitution eventually around um, all of our rights being free so that, that you know, these, these crazy bans can be introduced without having the consequences that they have been. Very, exactly. And for specifically for the LGBTQ community, what we'll be able to do is move forward on the Equality Act, which would for the first time give us federal protections as a community. So mm -hmm. right now we're just a patchwork of state level rights. We're, and, and some decisions made by the Supreme Court, but this would protect us in public accommodations, would protect us in employment, all of those types of things. And also one thing that was brought to the floor of the House that moved through the House, installed in the Senate, is um, the Respect for Marriage Act, mm -hmm. which would codify the decision made at the Supreme Court, which is now being questioned. It, it sounds so repetitive, but this is such an important election. And for the next decade, at least, it is one after another important election until we see our rights as communities who are marginalized, cemented, like you said, in the constitution, where we are embedded in the yes. framework of this country. Otherwise, we continue to be add-ons and second thoughts, which results in second-class citizens. Uh, absolutely. And I think, you know, I, I did want to like speak to the incredible work that GLAD has done, pioneered really in, in helping us recognize as a, as a community and as a culture, how when you don't have uh, equality codified in culture, you don't have it codified in, in policy. Can you talk a little bit more about how you are seeing kind of the the cultural imperative in this moment, the ability to make sure that you know, we see ourselves as free, so it helps us fight for freedom. Absolutely. Oh, thank you for that. You know, I think what I'm seeing now in the culture is that a lot of what we're seeing is that what's happening in the culture or what people, American folks feel is not being represented by the politicians and it's actually being unwound. So they're not representing how folks feel and they're trying to create a counterculture against our communities. Mm -hmm. um, and you're seeing that at the state level. And so even so much as like just in the, in the past 24 hours with the attack on Pelosi's husband and that being used as an opportunity to undermine the LGBTQ community and target 
us out of nowhere. Um, I know. I, I, so we we continue to be used as fodder in the political game of football that's happening. And we thought as a community, we moved past that after marriage equality and and we were seen as as equal. And it's it's simply not true uh, because it helps stir fear it mm -hmm. helps it's still it's the age old formula that we see politicians using of inciting a group getting fear using fear to incite and so we rely on our cultural institutions like what the stories that are told out of hollywood and the stories that are on streaming that humanize our community yeah. i will say i do want to say one last thing which is Social media in the past, I would say five to seven years has created a whole new level of, of weaponizing those tools against our community. What started as an amazing convener for our community that often we were so on the margins because we couldn't be who we wanted to be or we were in public. We were able to do that on social media and that was a great gathering space for us. It has since turned into a, a, a tool against us more so. Where we used to have our, our, our lobbying for Hollywood to tell our stories, we're now finding ourselves really on the defense with social media and trying to unwind so many of those lies that have permeated the culture. You know, a lot of what we are seeing, you know, as well in the um, reproductive rights and freedom space, it, you know, are people who are, are, are talking about the barriers that they're facing right now. They are talking about kind of what, what some of these journeys that they're on to get access to abortion care out of state they're talking about, you know, the impact of not being seen if they are trans or non-binary in this fight. They're talking about the barriers that they're seeing to democracy. And I and I feel like, you know, we can we can re-weaponize, we can take back control of, mm -hmm. of so many of these platforms because they 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 really are intended to be democratically governed, but it is really important for us to think about all of the ways in which we tell our stories, because that also helps us shift culture. And you can't, you know, deny, you know, when someone shares who they are, um, how important it is to be to be seen and recognized. And, and I think I find the stories that I'm seeing of folks who are looking for, you know, abortion access or trying to find ways to move through this new world, heart-wrenching, moving, and inspiring. It's about the power of the people, Sarah Kate, right? I think, you know, what we have seen since uh, the Dobbs decision is like an increase of young people, millennials. We've seen people of color. We've seen women. We've seen LGBTQ communities like register to vote in mass in a way that, you know, has been as unprecedented as the decision. And people are going to hear the polls. They're going to see how tight it is, you know, and I think we have to give more validity to the fact that people are fired up and enraged and, and help channel that into action on, um, on election day and, and make sure that we make the, you know, we make the difference in this election cycle, because between this election cycle and the next election cycle, like literally we have democracy in our hands. And so it's so important for us to, um, to stand in who we are. And that is, that is a powerful people, a powerful intersectional collection of folks who, who understand that all of our things that we care about, our very identities, how we express ourselves, all of our freedoms are tied. That is like the central piece of every movement that we are connected to. And so I think, you know, we have to make sure that the freedom vote uh, is, is realized. Because your vote really matters. And I always find it interesting when people say, if your vote didn't matter, then why are so many people trying to take it away from you? Hello. That, that is the truth. That is the yes. truth. Vote, 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 vote. They, that's yes. exactly what they want you to do. That's like a method of disinformation, right? They want you to, to not participate uh, and demoralize you. And we know we can stand firmly in the power. Yes.